Thank you for inviting me. Thank you everybody for being here and listening to me. I hope I'll be, this will be an enjoyable hour. I'll be talking about forecasting and retail. Oops, click here. And now first challenge is that my presentation doesn't want to go forward. All right, so I'll need to figure this one out. We'll manage. All right, so why do retailers need forecasts? And actually, a couple of years ago, I was traveling. I visited a retailer. It was a convenience store. It was not a SAP customer. And very important to say that. And I, I went around and I started taking pictures of the shelves. And I saw shelves that looked like this here. They were depressingly empty. And the important thing is you don't really see it here, but some of these are for promotion. So for instance, these are eggs, half dozens of eggs for one pound. So you see it's in the UK. And unfortunately, and that's a promotion, right? Uh, that's reduced price, but unfortunately you can't take advantage of that promotion because uh, there is nothing left, no product left over. Uh, sugar is out of stock too. Um, what else do we have? We have soft drinks, all of them here, empty, empty shelves all over the place. Heritage cheese, any two for three pounds. Well, there's only two left, so you may be lucky. If you're the next customer after uh, the present one, then you'll be unlucky because there'll be nothing left and so on. And so on it went and on it went. Uh, actually, uh, this was a My Local. It was a convenience store chain in the UK. And uh, one year later, I came back to the same store and wanted to see whether things had changed. And it turned out that the store, uh, that things had changed indeed. The store was closed down. And actually, not the store itself, but the entire chain had gone out of business. Two or 300 different convenience stores, they all went out of business. And then I went online and saw what checked what people were were writing about that and there was there were tons of, of exasperated comments and most of them or many of them were about not having enough product on the shelf and i, I particularly love this one down here they didn't have the daily mirror on their shelf which is essentially britain's most popular newspaper for goodness sakes how difficult is it to order britain's most popular newspaper my dog would make a better job at being manager you, you really you feel the pain you feel see the rage boiling in this person well the store went out of business because the customers were simply unhappy and that is one reason why retailers need forecasts i'm not saying that uh, they went out of business only because of bad forecasts what i'm saying is that a retailer does need good forecasts for stocking the shelves and for many other things and we'll talk about the different other use cases later on so what does a retailer need forecasts for well go into more details later on you'll need that for strategic planning tactical planning operational planning all kinds of planning processes they're all forward looking they all plan for the future and you need forecasts on for them you need for strategic planning you need to think about where do we want to open new stores or close old ones you need a forecast of what likely demand is going to be in the future Tactical planning, you need plans for um, assortment planning. What kind of an assortment do you want to have in your stores? What products do you want to carry in what stores? And which ones do you not want to carry? You need to forecast on that. And operational planning is store replenishment or distribution center DC replenishment. That's the empty shelves that we just saw. That's non-functioning store replenishment. So we'll talk about different things here. We'll talk mostly about characteristics of retail demand and about the dimensions of the challenge, which are intimately tied to the use cases that we forecast for. We'll talk a little about catastrophes because those always wake people up. We'll talk about earthquakes, pandemics, wars, and social media. And I put social media under catastrophes for a good reason. I have, I think it's a single slide on the M5 forecasting competition. I hope we'll get to that. And we'll have a couple of examples, a little horror show, and some conclusions at the end. So let's go into this, characteristics of retail demand. So here's a time series. So oh, we're on slide seven and we see the first time series. So you're in the right call here. Um, I admit that this is ancient history. This is 50 years old, but uh, it's, it's, it's timeless because uh, these are sales per day in one particular supermarket of one particular stock keeping unit. And that's a stock keeping unit that's still active. It's tomatoes, tomatoes sold by weight. And these are kilograms. And the first thing to notice is that actually this is a supermarket that sells up to more than 600 kilograms of tomatoes in a single day. That's a number because these are not just all tomatoes. There's just one particular stock keeping unit of tomatoes. And there's different tomatoes in a supermarket. Next time you go shopping, you take a look at how many different stock keeping units of tomatoes there are. There are the 
loose ones that you weigh yourselves. There's the pre-packaged ones that are come in packs, in pound bags or pound packs. There is the large tomatoes, the small tomatoes. There is the the red ones, the the green ones, and the yellow ones, and perhaps even blue ones nowadays. And they all come in conventional and organic. So you can. There's no problem with having 10 different stock keeping units, all of which are tomatoes. And of course, all of these need to be forecasted and restocked in the shelves separately. All right, so this is just one particular stock keeping unit, and actually, it's an ex extremely fast moving product. Most products in retail are much more slow moving. We'll see examples later on. This is a very fast moving one. But we already see the first couple of, of uh, things that you see here. The first thing to notice is that. Uh, there's some seasonality in here, right? We see lower sales when the year starts. So all these year dates, that's always the beginning of the year. We see lower sales in winter and higher sales in summer, especially early summer. That's where people do the barbecue and have their tomato salads. And then sales go down again, so sales go up again. So we have seasonality. And if we model this using seasonality, then we see perhaps something like this here. That would be a first model that just uses yearly seasonality and uh, it's smooth and then we have a forecast going out here that's our forecast for the future now that doesn't really look overly uh, promising so far many points are below uh, the line others are above the line and it, there is actually a pattern in here that we can exploit to improve the forecasts and actually, the next thing to look at is the day of week patterns. In retail, especially for fast moving products, you always have day of week patterns because, well, people do more shopping in on the weekend. And so you see higher sales on Saturday than for the rest of the week. These are just all the same dots for the same product. They're just plotted by day of week and then put violin plot or bean plots and box plots on top of them. And the store was closed on Sunday. This is a Central European store, the kind that is closed on Sunday. So that makes life easier. And you see that you have higher sales on Saturday than during the rest of the week. And that's actually important. And not necessarily for every single product, but it's certainly important for everything that's perishable. Because, uh, well, for tomatoes, it might work out. But if you have strawberries that you can't sell or three days running, whatever you haven't sold after the first day probably has to be marked down the second day and thrown out at the end of the second day. And there you really need to account for the fact that you have higher sales on Friday and Saturday. And this is a brick and mortar store, typical classical retail essentially. And of course, you all also have uh, they have week patterns in online sales where people will do more online shopping on the weekend where they have lots more time. Uh, so this is a common thing. And it also depends very much on your locality. Uh, so for instance, in Germany, you see higher sales typically in Western Germany on the Saturday, higher than on Friday. And in Eastern Germany, it's often the other way around. You see higher sales on Friday than on Saturday. That's just a cultural thing. And it very much depends. So we need day of week patterns. And we need to account for those. So, And these day of week patterns, um, yeah, are most important. Well, I talked about that, about uh, my strawberries and meat. Uh, for instance, chicken has extremely short shelf lives and so on and so forth. So we actually need to account for these. All right, let's include these. Now here's a another an additional and another model that accounts for both types of seasonalities, the intra-yearly seasonality, seasonality and the intra-weekly seasonality. And if we went down to even finer granularity, these are daily data. Um, you could also have sub-daily data. For instance, if you have convenience stores that have their own uh, convenience food that's pre prepared on the site, on the premise, and sold immediately for immediate consumption, like uh, like cooked chicken or sandwiches, uh, you can't just make your chicken in the morning and sell it in the evening. So you really need to do that. Whenever you cook a batch of chicken, you have to throw it out after two weeks, uh, after two weeks, after two hours. So essentially, what you need is uh, you need to look at the demand per two-hour bucket. And of course, you're selling more chicken around lunchtime than at the rest during the rest of the day. And then you also have on top of these two uh, seasonalities, intra-yearly and intra-weekly, you'd have another seasonality that's intra-daily. And you need to account for that one too, because you don't want to cook too much chicken in the morning that you have to throw away right before lunch hour comes and the big rush arrives. So you need up to three different kinds of seasonality that's happening here. There's also other seasonal effects like paycheck effects, where you sell 
see more sales uh, when the paychecks go out and that's again different by country in germany you have paychecks typically once per month or social security payments and in the us it's very often uh, bi-weekly paychecks and you see different patterns there and but that's typically much much weaker in terms of, of strength all right so we've seen that and now the next thing to look at prices we all know that when we go shopping we see prices and uh, prices go up prices go down you just put the price per kilogram in the local currency uh, with the with the scale at the right hand side here and we see whenever a price goes down for a couple of days uh, sales go up so there is some there are some promotions that are typically distinguished by reduced prices and then sales go up uh, makes sense right so we need to account for that one too and if we have an additional model that accounts for these uh, prices also and then we start seeing that these patterns uh, fit the data better and the forecasts actually account now for also for these uh, price changes right we have two price changes in the future one here and one over there and our model faithfully gives us higher forecasts so this starts looking reasonable right and we also see the the advantage of having store the store closed on sundays is that you every single week is one such hook right like a fish hook pattern and you actually see how you see uh, you always see monday through thursday and then friday and saturday and it always goes up and then there's a hole when the next week arrives or when the sunday is so we actually see the fish hook pattern this characteristic day of week pattern and uh, you can also see it in the forecast so this looks reasonable and that's essentially uh, the way I earn my living and that's essentially retail forecasting um, then things get a little more interesting now, interesting things are causal factors now we we've also we already saw prices prices go down sales go up wonderful what's more important is or when when you start looking at things a little more closely is that there's far more than prices happening here we have typically tons tons and tons of promotions and there's lots of interesting uh, abbreviations happening here we have tpr that's a temporary price reduction so just price goes down we communicate it to every customer everybody gets the same lower price and that's a simplest possible promotion could also have bogo buy one get one you buy one unit you get a second one unit for free that's a very again very simple thing you also sometimes see the more complicated things up to buy n units of product x at x percent off but get m units of product y a different product at y percent off that's probably the most uh the most abstract and the most encompassing way of having this promotion so this thing here is not a typo right uh, we don't support uh the full generality here but the 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 hard thing about retail forecasting is that the marketers come up with new promotions faster than the forecasters can include them in the models because we always have to think about how do we model this what they, that they just came up with and so it's 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 interesting and sometimes very complicated you get conditions sometimes you can't take advantage of just any promotion you have to be a member of the shopper cart of the shopper club you have to hold the card or have the app on your phone or you need to have a coupon that you perhaps got on your app or from the newspaper so you need not everybody can take advantage of the promotion it makes makes a difference right if only half of your shoppers can take advantage of a promotion it's going to have less of an uplift than if you have uh, then if everybody could take advantage of that could also have a promotion that doesn't reduce the price but says if you buy this product then you get additional shopper points on your card on your on your app in and so on uh, or gift cards or even airline miles uh, i've seen all kinds of things here especially in the us you go shopping and you get airline miles for whatever you just bought it sounds uh, strange for europeans but in the us it's pretty common you see lots of tactics or tactics tactics are the way uh, that we communicate the product the, the promotion to the customer so there's a promotion how do we tell customers that there's a promotion we could have a shelf tag we could have an end cap so an additional secondary placement a secondary like shelf with with product with the promoted product you could have a push message in your app or just a you open the app and you see it in the app that there is a promotion you could have 
a paper flyer or a TV ad or a, everything, right? And all these different ways of communicating the promotions have an impact, right? If you look at a paper flyer that you get thrown into your your, uh, your letterbox, if your promotion is on the first page, that has a higher uplift than if it's on page seven, bottom right somewhere. So there is a bit of a difference here. Suppression effects on regular sales. So if you have a promotion that only happens on part of for is only valid for part of your customers like if you have need to have a coupon to take advantage of this promotion then people who do not have that coupon can still buy the product at regular prices but of course there'll be lower regular sales during that promotion because some people can take advantage of the promotion but we always have to also forecast the regular sales separately and so we need suppression effects on the regular sales whenever such a conditional promotion is happening you have calendar events, all kinds of calendar events, and depending on where you are, these can be more or less complicated. You have Christmas, Chinese New Year, day of month effects, I already talked about the paycheck effects. You have holidays, uh, Germany, Southern Germany, you have lots of Thursdays that are holidays, and that always messes up the entire weekly pattern because then people take a long weekend or go shopping nicely on, on Friday and take a long time doing so, and suddenly they buy more on Friday or nobody buys anything on Friday because people are, are visiting their friends and relatives and they're not going shopping on Friday. So it's always very complicated around these holidays. We have other things like weather, cannibalization, complementarity. Uh, so I could fill in an entire talk all by itself on cannibalization and complementarity. You don't want to listen to me talk about that. Well, perhaps you do. And a couple of, of visualizations right up here. Like this is our old uh, user interface. You see the uh, you see a time series, and those are actually weekly sales, and they're very low. I think this is one up here, and that's two, and then that must be six or something. So that's a very slow moving product. And it's it's essentially, it's it's bombarded with promotions. All these little dots down here are different promotions. And uh, each row corresponds to one type of promotion. And it's just all this entire zoo that we saw on the left-hand side. Uh, of course, you see that most of these don't have any impact at all. But well, we only see a single product here. The retailer has a lot of product and we will come to that later on so there's a really a mass data problem happening here yeah discuss that here this is another time series that's happening with different tactics and a discount these are just boolean predictors when is a certain tactic active and uh, this up here is the promotional price i'm just putting in uh, like uh, the price whenever it's going down i'm not putting in the regular price it's just one of these uh, abstract plots that I generate by the hundreds, by the thousands when I run an analysis because I just want to get a quick overview of what's happening here. And you already see I removed the y-axis, but you, you see that there is like some movement down here. Some sales are happening here. These are again daily sales. But if this product has a steep price change that's announced by tactic one, for instance, and you have a humongous uplift. And this could be a factor of 20 or something. There's probably something that people will stock up on. Well, they will pantry load, as the retailer says. So you just buy a lot of this here uh, because it's going to keep a while. It has a long shelf life and it may be expensive. So whenever it's on promotion, you buy a lot of that. And that makes my life harder. Uh, I'm not telling you not to do that anymore. It's just kind of keeps me in my job. So we're happy about that. Here is one calendar event. Um, uh, this is actually data uh, that I saw a long time ago. And sometimes when, when I have people in front of me, I like to ask them what they th what calendar events they think are happening here. We have these vertical bars. There are three different colored vertical bars, and they stand for different calendar events. And you see there is a blue one here. That's Christmas. That's uh, always right at before the beginning of the new year. And that's not having a lot of an impact here. And then we have a gray and a green one. I always like to ask people what they think these are. And these are actually aggregate sales, un total unit sales in an entire store. And uh, some people actually know that this must be Chinese New Year, right? The green one here, that's Chinese New Year, where you have humongous sales going up here. And so this is a store that is much more dependent on Chinese New Year for its sales than Christmas. The gray one is the Mid-Autumn Festival, another Chinese festival, but less important. And that's actually a high-end drugstore jewelry retailer and where you buy presents for your loved ones for Chinese New Year. 
And this is actually one of four stores that I saw in Hong Kong. And the other three had completely different patterns. The other three had huge uplifts on Christmas and much lower uplifts on Chinese New Year. And you actually saw in the aggregate sales data, you saw the demographics because this store obviously had more Chinese clientele and the other three stores had obviously more Western clientele that uh, uplifts on Christmas and lower for Chinese New Year. So actually see what kind of people go to a store. And you see similar things when you have one store right next to a high school where all the kids go and buy their small bottles of Coke or sweets or whatever, probably not healthy stuff. And versus another store that's somewhere on the outskirts of town where mommy and daddy buy the, the healthy food for the family dinner. And just today I had a little conversation with a customer about um, the stores, the convenience stores that they have on highway stops. And uh, those have a huge impact of uh, school holidays, especially on Saturdays when everybody's on the highway and standing in the traffic jam and just hopping out to get a little something to eat while and going back into the traffic jam. So they have a very interesting calendar events too that are mostly driven by school holidays. Another thing, we already saw that one. This is not, uh, this is not just checking whether you're all still awake. That's the same plot that we saw before, but right now I'd like to point to something different. Before we looked at the means and the averages or medians in these box plots going up over the week. And but the important thing that I'd like to talk about right now is the heteroscedicity that we see here. We see that these plots, the bean plots and the box plots, they show much more spread as we go towards the weekend. Because we do not only see higher sales going towards the weekend, we also see much more spread Right. So and uh, this, of course, has an impact when we do replenishment where we need safety stocks because we can't just uh, replenish for mean sales. We need to replenish for to, to ensure a certain safety amount or a, a, a certain service level. People don't want to come in and find the shelves empty. So we need actually need a higher stock, higher safety stock on the weekend than at the beginning of the week to ensure the same service level. And then the problem is if these are perishable products and you're more likely to be left over, uh, you have left, stock left over at the end of the day, and what do you do with that? That's an interesting conversation to have as long as customers don't like going to the store on Saturday afternoon to find the shelves empty of perishable fruit, vegetables, meats. Uh, we'll probably have to deal with the fact that there will be something left over that we have to throw away. And we have the exact same situation during promotions. Promotions also higher sales, also much higher variances. And it's more than, for instance, Poisson, it uh, variance does scale faster than the mean. So we have over dispersion and the over dispersion really depends on our causal effects here. So we need quantile forecasts. When we talk about replenishment, we'll talk about other use cases later on. That's again, our but our tomatoes, I'm just looking at the forecast period. We, it's actually a holdout period that we have here. So we have the actual sales going down, happening down here. And we have the point forecast or the expectation forecast. That's the darker, almost red line at the bottom. And then we have quantile forecasts per day on top of that. I think it's 80, 90, and 95% quantiles. Don't quote me on that. And you see how we account for that. The safety amount, which is just delta between the forecast, the point forecast, the expectation forecast, and the quantile forecast, that delta goes up towards the end of the week and is actually higher when the sales price goes down than during non-promoted weeks. So we account for that. And we still have in replenishment the question, do we really want the same service level in a promotion as outside promotions? Because that probably means that we'll have stuff left over at the end of promotion. No retailer likes that because it clogs up their back room. Another challenge that we have in retail forecasting is that we typically have very short time series because on average, that's just a rule of thumb, retailers will change 30% of their assortment every year. That's rule of thumb in grocery. It depends if you're a fashion retailer, of course, it's gonna be much more, but that's grocery. So few products will have two years of history, for instance, which you'd like to have to, to really detect seasonality, yearly seasonality. Well, you really need two years or more, but that's half of your assortment. And then sometimes you see something like this here where you're, you're given a, four, a time series that has like, like five data points, and then you're told to 
fit a model and forecast out. And actually, I did a good job forecasting here uh, for these two things. Um, well, uh, that's not surprising because, of course, for this presentation long time ago when I first did that, I, of course, selected the forecasts that were good. So it's a bit of marketing here. We also have bad forecasts, but I'm not showing those. Uh, we already, I already mentioned fashion. Fashion is also a fun little thing. Uh, fashion and consumer electronics are mostly characterized by life cycle and seasonal products, so especially life cycles. You see the life cycles on the left-hand side, and those are, those are actually um, fashion products. So they're aggregate sales across multiple stores, and you see the very typical fashion uh, sales that start out at the beginning of the season and then taper off and have this long uh, tail where you sell a couple of products later on. Could be even many months later after the, the product's really been gone out of fashion as it is when the life cycle has ended. So typically, you would not repeat the product. Uh, but you sometimes the customer will reuse product codes. And that was a fun talk when I saw these product, a, a single product, or what I thought was a single product, having multiple seasons. And I asked them, what's, what's happening here? Uh, is this product really having multiple seasons? And they looked back and they said, well, well, no, we're just reusing product codes. I assume that bits and bytes cost them money or something. So they're reusing them and recycling them. It just made my life much harder. So fun little things in terms of data quality. You sometimes have predecessor relationships. You have a new product that you're just going to sell in the new spring season, but that's very similar to a product that you sold last year. Perhaps it has a completely different color because blue is the new black. So it's a new product that's blue, and you have a predecessor that was black, but they have this a similar price point. They're sold uh, to a similar uh, demographic and so on. So then you can work with predecessor products and predecessor relationships to get a forecast for the new product. You often know when the when the product starts, but then when it's first pushed to the stores, but you rarely know when it ends because it's probably going to be sold until there's nothing left. Sometimes you have markdowns at the end of the of the life cycle, and when you just yeah, try to clear your inventory out of the store, you you reduce the 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 price, and it's kind of there's a bit of a question of how to deal with markdowns because we really ideally we wouldn't. We would like not to have markdowns. We'd like to clear out the inventory at full price right before the next fashion assortment hits the shelves. So we really don't want markdowns. So how do we deal with those? Can we just remove the markdown sales so we account for them? So fun little things. And there's the here the interplay between what we're forecasting and what we forecast for really starts getting interesting. On the right hand side, we see strawberries. And uh, strawberries are not sold all year long. Those are local strawberries, not the ones that are flown in from uh, warmer parts of the world. Those are local ones. And they have a defined selling season every year. And I try to detect that because I sometimes I don't know the selling season. I just know when the product is sold. right? So, and we see a yearly seasonality. And here, for instance, the selling season went on for a while but there was nothing sold in this store. Why do I know that the selling season went on? Because I detected it on other stores. So I took multiple stores for this stock keeping unit and detected from when till when the product was sold in most stores. And for instance, this store simply didn't sell any strawberries during second half of the strawberry season this year and messes up my forecasts. Everything messes up my forecasts. I also see fun little things down here. You see suddenly uh, small sales that are happening somewhere in the middle of winter. Did they really have like a, one pound of strawberries on the shelf that they sent then sold? Probably not. Probably these are just data errors because somebody inadvertently pressed the code for strawberries on the scale when they weighed their potatoes or whatever. And then it was uh, booked into the point of sale system as strawberries. And as a matter of fact, actually, it was potatoes. They were selling potatoes, but somebody hit the button for strawberries, and the system says, well, I just sold like a kilo of strawberries in the middle of winter. And it, of course, you could say now, well, doesn't that get, get checked off with stocks? And doesn't that get flagged as invalid if we don't have any stocks of strawberries? We'll come to the wonders of stock keeping later on. All oh, right, actually, we'll come to them right now here. We, we have out of stocks versus seasonality and in our articles. So stocks are fun. 
Um, sometimes you'll see products like these here. These are just simulated data just to explain what's happening. These are uh, sales could happen like this here. You have sales and suddenly a string of zeros and then sales again. And that is rather obviously something where you don't have sales, not because nobody wanted the product, but because it was out of stock. The shelf was empty, like the pictures at the very beginning. So what you want to do is you want to detect such long consecutive strings of zeros and you want to deal with them in some way. For instance, you could remove them because if you don't remove them, then uh, you know what's going to happen next year, uh, this part of the year, the system's going to think there was a seasonality here and the system's going to give you a, a forecast that goes down because it thinks there's seasonality in here. You don't want that. So you need to treat that in some way. Remove them uh, to avoid bias or whatever. Uh, for a slower moving product, a similar long period of zero sales can just happen by chance, so shouldn't be removing anything here. That can make sense. And then that would probably not be detected as any way of seasonality. Sometimes you have these seasonal products like the strawberries we just saw, and then we just we shouldn't remove the zeros down here because these are not just out of stocks. They're also low demand. Well, perhaps for strawberries, it is low demand, but if you have ski helmets, uh, it, it could look like this here with higher sales in winter and no demand in summer and no sales in summer. So it gets gets difficult. If you remove the zero sales in summer and say these are invalid, then you'll probably get a non-seasonal forecast going forward. And then suddenly you have a high forecast for ski helmets in summer and a, bi a downward bias in winter and then your customer gets unhappy. And sometimes you do have these seasonal products with and out of stock in the middle of the season. You want to detect those. So it gets more and more complicated. Deeper you dive into these data, as always for us. And sometimes you have in-out articles. Those are products that are just, um, uh, those are the, the kinds of things that you sell on promotion, like the 550 gram uh, jar of Nutella. That's not available all year. Typically, you have only the 500 gram jar, but sometimes you sell the 550 gram jar. And that looks like this here. It gets pushed into the store. You sell it for a couple of weeks, and then it goes away again. And then it gets pushed into the store again, and then it goes away again. And here again, you want to remove the zeros, because the zeros uh, represent non-sales, because there was no product in the shell on the shelves. You want to forecast that is conditional on having product on the shelf. So you want to forecast on this level here. So you need to automatically remove the zeros. And of course, finally, you could also have an out of stock on the 550 gram jar of Nutella in the middle of the season. You again need to treat that one and remove it. So data cleansing is a fun little uh, exercise here. As I said before, you, you might be thinking, well, we, we have stocks, right? We know when product is on the shelf. So can't we leverage that? And yes, to a degree, we can. Um, uh, the problem, we the retailers have something they call a perpetual inventory. Not all retailers. When I started working in this business, it turned out that the US retailers didn't know what stocks they had in their stores. Uh, it was an interesting revelation that they didn't even know how much product they had on their shelves wouldn't believe that that's possible. But in Europe, typically, they know that. So they have a perpetual inventory, a system inventory. The problem is that these inventories are not accurate. And they're horrendously inaccurate, really horrendously inaccurate. And there's been a stream of research going back at least to this paper by De Horatius and Roman in Management Science in 2008, uh, who did, well, they, they actually walked into the store and counted, physically counted how many units they had on the shelves for multiple SKUs, and they found that 35% of system inventories were accurate. It's not 35 were wrong, it was 35 were accurate. And everything else was off by anything between one and more than 500 units. So system inventories were really bad. Now, you might think, okay, well, that's 15 years ago, things must have improved by now. IT, technology, uh, RFID, everything. Well, actually, this is a more recent thing that was uh, released by, that was written up by Yasin Rikik and Arisintados, uh, and they did a very similar approach. They looked at seven different retailers, and they found uh, errors around 70%, again, 60 to 70%, except for one guy. I really need to ask him someday what this fashion retailer what is that only had 6% wrong inventories and the inventory some of them went were negative some of them were positive it depends on the retailer and on the assortment that they have especially 
except for this number for this uh, guy e over here and of course uh, these inaccurate inventories iri inventory record inaccuracy there's different implications if you're just replenishing and you need today's inventory to know how much products do you need to order i have a forecast i know i have 10 units on the shelf i have a forecast of 20 well i need to order 10 units okay and if i only have nine on the shelf and believe i have 10 and my inventory is off by one unit it's not going to make a huge difference what does make a difference is when people think they have one unit on the shelf and the inventory is off by wrong, by one and they actually have zero units on the shelf because then they have an out of stock and they don't even know about it and then they're not having any sales because there is no product on the shelf and then you have long strings of zero sales but the system will never reorder because it thinks well i have one unit on the shelf the system inventory tells me so and you never know that it's it's wrong then you z actually physically have nothing on the shelf and so your your zero sales perpetuate yours themselves and that's called a silent delisting in, in retail and that's a major problem for us um a couple of examples that i just saw uh, last week i believe uh, this is a do-it-yourself a home improvement retailer and uh, what we see here is again in black the sales the daily sales of a particular stock keeping unit that's an automatic irrigation system so we're away from the tomatoes now right we're talking about gardening equipment uh, per day in one particular store and we also had stocks those are the red lines here with this scale the axis on the right right they went up to 29 units on on the stock and so we see this here and the dashed line gives us where the zero line for the stock right and what do we see when we look at that a little? Well, we see that we had sales, sales of one or two or four units with no movement in the stock. Shouldn't happen really, right? Well, that's the way the stock happens. Uh, here's a plate vibrator. That's the kind of thing that you use to harden your driveway, right? So you're, you're uh, redoing your driveway. You need to go over it with a plate vibrator to just toughen it and yeah, hammer it down. Uh, not the kind of thing that you buy in a grocery store again. And again, we have sales and stocks. Uh, there was a daily sales. I assume two people who came in at the same day. Uh, it's not that one person bought two of those. And what do we see here? We see that the stocks, it's like the converse of the first one. The stocks are moving. The stocks are going down and going up again and going down again without any sales happening at the same point in time. Doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? And finally, here's my favorite. That's clay granules. That's kind of uh, that's a little clay balls that you put into your your planters pots and then plant stuff in. I'm not the gardener, so but some people do that. Obviously, obviously. And what we see here is well, the fun thing is uh, we have these negative stocks down here, right? So we have zero we have a zero stock, and we're having lots of sales in spite of zero stocks. And at some point in time, the stock just degenerating, going to negative whatever ninety. 150 or whatever a big number in, in any case and then we have a, a then we have a couple of deliveries and the stock goes positive again and then another delivery here stock goes up again then stock just goes down it goes again below zero and there's always explanations for all these kinds of things and uh, but it's always kind of hard to make stocks work for you to improve your forecasts if stocks systematically exhibit this kind of fun thing Wow, we're we're almost done with the time. I'm so sorry, but I, I'll try to. I may skip a couple of things. The dimensions of the challenge. I'll skip this one here. But uh, I'd really like to talk about this slide here. Um, we have multiple dimensions in forecasting granularity. So we have at least a time dimension, a supply chain dimension, and the product dimension. And we can aggregate and forecast on different levels. And the recent M5 forecasting competition looked at 12 different aggregation levels. And that's completely realistic because different use cases need forecasts on different levels. For instance, store replenishment, that's the kind of thing that we started out with, uh, needs forecasts on a granularity stock keeping unit times day times store, right? We need a forecast per stock keeping unit per day per store looks like a bit of a no-brainer so in this little three-dimensional uh, plot here would be at the very yeah, bottom left for instance um if we have a distribution center so these are the big store the big uh, distribution centers there are somewhere we don't see them near the highways uh, where the product is shipped out uh, to from the from the supplier and then shipped out from the dc to the stores 
and they of course replenish much more rarely so you need a forecast really on the skew times week times dc level much higher volumes typically and much more logistics happening here if you're doing promotion planning then you typically don't care whether you're selling your promoted product in a particular store on a particular day what you care about is how many units i'm going to sell across the entire retail chain or at least the formats or a subgroup of stores and over the entire pure promotion period which could be multiple days or weeks or even months so we need an aggregate forecast Markdown planning, similar things. We need a forecast per SKU or perhaps a level higher because we're marking down not on the SKU level, but on the product level, which is multiple variants that are differentiated by size and color, very prevalent in fashion, for instance. And we need that on a day or even hour level. So when do we need to, for to mark down? If we mark down fish, you want to do that at the end of the day and sell off the rest of the fish because it, before it goes bad when you close the stores. And we need real forecast on a very fine-grained level per uh, per time and also per location and so on so the different use cases all need very very different aggregates and they sometimes conflict and clash and then you go into read into hierarchical forecasting and then interesting and it's complicated things happen uh, the sheer dimensions of the data. So we have all these, I'm not talking about the about the aggregation levels right now, but just if you look at the very bottom level, store replenishment, need forecasts on uh, SKU times day times store level. Typical retailer has anything like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 stock keeping units in a single store. Could be as low as, as 1,000, that's the hardcore discounters. They have very few stock keeping units, but the typical Groceries, supermarkets, probably more closer to 20,000 products. And every single one needs to be forecast every time you make a, sco a stocking decision, which could be every day. So, or at least multiple times a week, depends on the assortment. It could have a thousand stores, that's larger retailer in Europe. Uh, Walmart has tens of uh, thousands of stores. Smaller retailers may only, perhaps only have a couple of hundred. So multiple years of history and you need millions of time shares every single day and nobody can look at those so what you need is extreme robustness because if a forecast is off and it, it's not caught then that can lead to extremely bad replenishment situations where you suddenly have a full truck of one particular stock keeping unit going to a store because it was all automated and nobody caught that so we really need robustness and i always like to say I'm happy when I can improve my forecasts on average, but what's more important is not to have too many bad forecasts. I always look at the bad forecasts. When I improve our, our algorithms or data managing or whatever, I always look at do the worst forecasts, do they get better or do they get even worse? Because it's the worst forecasts that break the trust in the system and that end up on our desk and that really make people yeah not rely on the forecasts anymore. A average accuracy is important, but Worst case accuracy is actually more important. Catastrophes. Actually, the, the other topics are much shorter than the first one, so we'll actually manage. This was an earthquake, actually, in New Zealand. A couple of years ago, uh, in 2010, we had an earthquake. And what happened then, uh, what happened was that the gas line and the, the water lines burst. You didn't have running water coming out of your taps anymore. Well, what did people do? They bought bottled water and tons of that. They use bottled water for cooking, for brushing your teeth, for cleaning yourself, for washing, for everything. So you had a huge spike in bottled water going up here. And then as the mains, as the, the water lines were slowly repaired, this demand went down again. And then in the middle, there was another earthquake happening that hit Christchurch uh, a couple of months later. And so you really, the problem is you can't forecast for earthquakes, but what you really need to do is you need to account for them for the future. So and we can mark these data as invalid so that uh, the system doesn't think, oops, there's a seasonality happening here and next year it's going to look the same. No, probably not because earthquakes don't have seasonality. Uh, we all saw this uh, two years ago. This is actually, yeah, December 2020, almost exactly two years ago. That's my personal supermarket. Uh, actually, a customer of ours have to admit that that's toilet paper or no toilet paper. That's the worst of the corona virus pandemic in Germany. There was you know, a run to toilet paper. Everybody bought toilet paper. And uh, we saw a couple of other effects where people 
apparently in South America, I'm going to skip over many of those, they bought cat litter boxes because they, uh, first time they had their lockdown, they suddenly noticed that Kitty has a dirty or old litter box, so we need a new litter box for Kitty or something. I don't know. So this coronavirus brought out the very interesting things. And then later on last year, there was the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And in Germany, there was a big fear that uh, the supply for flour or for sunflower oil might run out because Ukraine is a big supplier of both of these. And so people went and started panic buying flour and sunflower oil. And then the stores looked like this here. I think they got out the exact same notices that they're only selling five units to every shopper, uh, just kind of duration stuff. And honestly, yeah, I talked about social media. I think most of this was not so much driven by the actual underlying supply difficulties. It was mostly driven by social media and uh, word of mouth and people just getting uh, uh, some, some social media craze going through the internet. All right, the M5 forecasting competition. Um, yeah, that was like a year ago there or two years ago. Uh, there was the M5 forecasting competition. That was a big forecasting challenge with Walmart data, so real retail data and so and that's of course the uh, big topic for retail forecasters and every retailer and every forecaster in the retail space has to engage with that in some way um it was the first thing to point out is that walmart is not a typical retailer right it's it's huge yeah we know that but it's also uh non-standard in its operations it has a really an everyday low price strategy edlp most retailers run a promotional strategy. They do promotions. Most products are promoted sometime to get people into the store. Walmart is doing an everyday low price strategy. So they have much smoother operations. That makes life much easier on the supply chain. And uh, there is much less movement in their sales. They still have some price changes, especially when they can reduce prices because they haggled with their, uh, with their suppliers and they have a lot of market power and they can reduce prices once in a while. And uh, they, of course, announce that, but it's it's different from a promotion because when they reduce price, uh, they that's the new, the new regular price. They're not just reducing prices for a week and then going back up again. When they reduce price, that's new regular price and it stays that way. And so there's much less uh, pantry loading during promotions as for other retailers. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And uh, the, what was funny was that the winner was a South Korean student at very little formal forecasting training. And uh, he used XJBoost, as did most of the top contenders, uh, which is not very interpretable. And that's actually an important thing for retailers because they are mostly not data scientists and they need to understand what's happening. And so what we personally prefer is a regression-based approach where you can actually look at your regression coefficients and say this forecast is so high because of that regression coefficient together with this predictor setting. And you can actually explain it and debug it. It's pretty hard to debug in XJBoost. Uh, a, a single bad forecast in one of these less interpretable models. And one fun little thing that got kind of lost in in all the uh, in all uh, in all the commentary was that uh, there was a benchmark method, exponential smoothing, extremely simple forecasting method. The first thing you learn when you do exponential oh uh, the the uh, the local alarm system is going to start calling the police in a couple of minutes so i'll need to finish up soon uh, and only 7.5% of submissions outperformed its extremely simple benchmark and i found that interesting because those people at kaggle about 5000 people that submitted probably some of them abandoned their submissions agreed but uh, there were some uh, there were lots of people that actually knew what they were doing and it took some work to submit uh, these uh, these uh, uh, these forecasts, and if then most of your of the submissions are beaten by this very simple exponential smoothing method, that tells us something. Uh, all right, a little horror show. Well, I'm not going to go into most of these. This is this is breakfast coffee in one stockkeeping unit in six different stores. And what's interesting here is. I'm not showing the promotional time periods, but you know when the promotion happened, right? It's when you had sales of over 1,000 uh, for a time series that is typically on the low teens per day. So sometimes people stock up really badly. 
uh, chicken, where you saw, where you see that they obviously stocked up to about 12 units per day. And when they were sold, they were sold. And there was no more than 12 being sold at every single day. Extremely simple to forecast because you know that your forecast doesn't need to exceed 12. So it's very simple to forecast this thing here. I apologize for these sounds. I unfortunately don't know how to turn this off. Um, chocolate cake. Uh, what I found interesting here is a time series that has lots of zeros and then suddenly they sell one unit. And then they sell another couple of units, but I don't think they really put the chocolate cake on the shelf and let it expire. I assume these were customer orders. It's also an interesting thing here. And so on and so forth. So conclusions. So retail forecasting is extremely fun little thing. So for the researchers, I would say that optimizing accuracy on curated data sets uh, probably has point, reached the point of diminishing returns. And if everybody now uses the M5 data set and improves on a couple of percentage points on that, I don't know whether that's going to make much of a difference here. Uh, often, you only have predictors feature and display, and that's too simplistic. Uh, open challenges, how do we account for these disruptions in a supply chain? How do we deal with omnichannel data? Practitioners, uh, these causal data, these promotions are hugely important, enormously important. And you need to really distinguish the different promotion types. Um, which forecasts are relevant? You need to really figure out which forecasts you need for which use case. What are you forecasting for? And for both, you need to be aware of these inventory record inaccuracies that you have that will poison your data. And uh, explainability is the one thing that's very important to practitioners. And that uh, doesn't come out if you run deep learning or uh, some kind of boosting method or something. It can't explain it anymore. Yes, I know there is explainable AI, but uh, that only gets you so far. And especially when it comes to debugging problematic forecasts, it's you have a problem. All right, anybody who wants to learn more, uh, we wrote a big uh, review paper over 30 pages uh, took us a long time. Anybody who's interested, send me an email. I'll happily supply it to you. Here's my email address. Thank you very much.